Welcome back to chapter 2.1 of the video series. In the last chapter, which is chapter 2.0, we had a bit of introduction to semiconductor physics and the concept of free carriers. Here in chapter 2.1, we are going to introduce a new concept called doping. And before I start, I would like to thank RS Grassroots Education for sponsoring this video. You can find written versions of my video under the Design Spark website, links down in the description box. In these articles, I've put down links to further reference materials for your further reading. These articles are the ones that I previously used before while I was learning about solar cells, so rest assured that they are good ones. So now, there is nothing left to do but to sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. One of the most important properties of semiconductors is its ability to undergo doping. No, not that kind of doping. This is the legal kind. Stay in school, kids. Doping is what controls the degree of conductivity of a semiconductor. We can represent energy band diagrams with just two simple lines, with E subscript C representing the lowest conduction band energy level and E subscript V representing the highest valence band energy level. Now, we know from part one that free electrons and holes can float in the conduction band and valence band of a semiconductor, respectively. With the process of doping, we can either introduce more free electrons in the conduction band or more free holes in the valence band. To understand how this works, let us take a look at the periodic table. I want to give you something to do. Pause the video and find silicon. No, not Waldo, silicon. I'll give you a hint. Its chemical symbol is SI. It's right here. Silicon belongs to group 14 which means that it has four valence electrons. If we take a look at the basic crystal lattice model of silicon, each silicon atom forms covalent bonds by pairing its four valence electrons with their adjacent silicon atoms. This forms a stable crystalline silicon lattice. Now, what if I were to take an element from group 15, like phosphorus, to replace one of the silicon atoms. Phosphorus has five valence electrons, so there is one remaining electron unable to form covalent bond. This unbonded electron can very easily enter the conduction band and become a free carrier. This means now we have generated an extra free electron in the conduction band. The more phosphorus doped into silicon, the more free electrons form since one phosphorus atom will result in one free electron. So, semiconductor scientists usually manipulate precisely the concentration of phosphorus to control the amount of free electrons in the conduction band. If doping results in more free electrons in the conduction band, we call it n-type doping. The semiconductor will then be an n-type semiconductor. If doping results in more free holes, we call it p-type doping. The semiconductor will then be a p-type semiconductor. The n in n-type doping stands for the negative charge of the extra electrons. The p in the p-type doping stands for the positive charge of the extra holes. We can perform n-type doping to silicon by using any of the elements from group 15, since they all have five valence electrons which is one more than silicon. Phosphorus, arsenic, and antimony are commonly used as n-type dopants for silicon. P-type doping, on the other hand, is performed by using elements from group 13, which has only three valence electrons, like gallium and boron. The crystal lattice for a P-type doped semiconductor using boron looks something like this. Due to the empty space, created by doping, we created a hole in the valence band. This hole can easily transport within the valence band by having 
the neighboring silicon electron replacing that empty space, which is why it is a free carrier. Again, the more concentration of boron added, the more free carrier hole that is generated. So, in essence, N-type semiconductors have extra free electrons in the conduction band, while P-type semiconductors have extra free holes in the valence band. Now, you may wonder, why exactly do we need to do this? Why do we need these extra free electrons and holes? Well, obviously, they are there for a reason. We will find out soon. That's it, guys, for this chapter. In this video, we learned about the concept of doping. In the next chapter, we are going to learn an important concept called Fermi Energy Level. Take care and goodbye.